right. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, getting in today uh, with a couple meetup issues, but hopefully people will be trickling in here over the next couple minutes. But we'll we'll kind of get started. We've got a pretty full agenda, which is great. Um, really diving into to Microsoft lists. So um, with that, I'm simply going to hand it over to Nate and Mickey to um, kick us off for the first half, and then we'll kick off Alex at the, the, the second. Go ahead. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks, everybody, for joining. I just share my screen here. All right. Cool. So welcome. Yeah, my name is Nate Chamberlain, and welcome to All You Need to Know About Microsoft Lists. I've got Mickey with me here today, and we both work at Centric Training in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, so we've got our information up there on the screen. And when we're not training people, we both kind of have our, our side things going on. So I'll let Mickey talk about hers. Uh, here in a minute. And then for me, I just blog at natechamberlain.com. So off to you, Mickey. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I do Centric training where I, I mainly focus on training and just strategy around our Microsoft 365 program that we offer. And, um, and then I also have a consulting company. So on the side and weekends and nights and all that good stuff, um, I work with a variety of clients and, and building solutions for them or migrating them to the cloud or, you know, a variety of different things. So, yeah, glad to be here today. Thanks. Awesome. All right. So uh, I did something with our, our topic here today for our intro. Uh, so just a preview of one thing that you'll see today is the ability to use lists to uh, create different views. And so for our, our speaker profiles there, uh, you're seeing it both in the traditional list format that you may be most familiar with, but then also a customized gallery view as well. All right, so uh, we're going to start out with some basics. Uh, many of you are probably already familiar with some of these very uh, beginning steps, but when we get into some of the more specific topics, be sure to ask questions. You can use the chat if you'd like, or if you want to unmute, that's fine as well. Um, but I'm going to get us started with the, the basic concepts, then hand it off to Mickey, who's going to talk more about how we can integrate lists with other experiences. So Nate for the basics and Mickey for taking it to that next level. So uh, to get to list, you can just start from office.com. That's my favorite starting point for any app in Microsoft 365 because it's kind of like your virtual desktop, right? So we use the app launcher in the upper left hand corner from there to get to just about anything, including lists. And I can also find lists embedded in uh, SharePoint and Teams. And in fact, uh, if some of you are brand new to SharePoint and lists, uh, you may not know that list kind of grew out of SharePoint. That's kind of its, its birthplace, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so when we're creating lists from any of these locations, from list, from Mike, or from Teams, from SharePoint, uh, we get a few options, and those are basically you can start from blank, uh, or if you want to import existing data, let's say you've been using Excel for years and you've got massive tables, uh, no sense copying and pasting 100 rows at a time, <laughs> you can just use the from Excel option. Uh, now, that being said, that is the only option that you see when you're creating a new list that would allow you to import existing rows of data, and everything else is going to be a blank list with maybe some uh, conditional formatting built in, different columns and things that we'll hear about here in just a moment. Uh, but yeah, you can start from blank. From Excel, you can copy lists. So let's say you do something every quarter, then you can copy last quarters to start this quarters, um, and then there's built in templates. Now, one fun thing that not a lot of people know about the templates is that if you start in uh, list or SharePoint to create your list, you actually have three fewer templates to choose from. Whereas if you start from Teams, you get three more. And I can just zoom in here a little bit to show those to you. Uh, but we've got incidents, patients, and loans if you start from Teams. All right. So uh, when you're thinking about lists, when you're thinking about creating these using whatever method you just saw, uh, you have to kind of decide, first of all, who's the audience? Because by separating lists into a separate app, we got the ability to basically create private lists. Um, just like OneDrive is yours and SharePoint is ours, lists can now also be yours or ours. Uh, so if you start from the list app, that's when you're going to get the ability to, as you can see on the right hand side, save a new list, no matter which method you're using to create it, uh, to something called my list. And so that's basically going to be private to you until you share it with someone else, because you can still share just like something in your OneDrive. Um, now ours, of course, would be if you created it from SharePoint or Teams, where the membership of that location is already uh, expanded beyond yourself. So starting with you know lists being yours, starting with the the OneDrive kind of side of things, 
um, the list that you create and save to my list are actually stored on your OneDrive site. And not everybody knows that OneDrive is basically built on SharePoint. It's kind of its own little SharePoint site out there. So even though you wouldn't go through OneDrive to get to your list, that's truly where they're, they're living. Uh, but you would still go through office.com, click on list, just the app, and then you'll find your list there. So those are private to you until you share, and I'll show you that here in just a moment how you could do that, um, whether it's the whole list or one specific item in a list. Now when we're talking about hours, which Mickey's going to show you a little bit later how to bring in a list uh, to page experiences and teams and all of that, um, you can access those from lists as well, um, or of course SharePoint and Teams. And just like I said, anybody who's already part of that team or site already has access to it, and most likely the same access you have to it. All right. So let's hop out. Let's get out of these slides and do a little bit of demo. So I'm going to start here on office.com. Again, that's kind of like our virtual desktop. And I'm going to start by using my app launcher and going straight to the list app. So I'm not going to SharePoint or Teams first. There we go. And I can already see some recent lists that I've been working on. So I've got those here, but I'm going to start just creating a new list. And here's what we were seeing before, but we're, we're missing three templates, right? Because we're starting from lists and not teams. Uh, but we can create a blank list, import existing, copy, or use a template. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the beginning steps. We're not going to do this whole thing. Uh, but I'll go through the beginning steps, and you can see that uh, the ability to save it to my list. Maybe. First meetup and now list. Let me do a refresh. <laughs> There we go. All right, so I'm choosing a template. I can kind of get an idea of what my data could look like once I start populating it, use that template. And then right here, only from the list app, do you get the option to save it to my list or one of your SharePoint sites or teams. Okay. So from here, if I did save it to my list, that's going to be private. There we go. And I can see at the very top, my name in this demo environment is Alex Wilbur. And I can see at the top, I've got the, the domain dash my that tells me it's onedrive.sharepoint.com slash personal. So that's just a traditional OneDrive URL and then my username. All right, so it's stored on my OneDrive site. And from here, knowing that it's private to me right now, uh, when I'm ready to share it, let's say I add a bunch of items or I copy and paste them or import them or use Power Automate, uh, whatever the method is that I use to get data in there, when I'm ready to share my private list with somebody, you just click share at the top. And this is kind of a nice feature that came with list um, that you'll see in SharePoint as well, where uh, you know it used to be with a list, you'd have to you know break inheritance on permissions and go through the old classic settings to share a list. But now we just have a, a convenient share button that looks a lot like uh, what we see with just a file, right? Uh, so for my entire list in my OneDrive site, basically, I click share. I can put a name in here. There we go. And the options here are a little bit different than you would see when you're sharing a file. I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, but basically, we can give someone full control to the entire list. So they're kind of like a co-owner in that way, and they could do anything they want to it. I uh, can just give them the edit list access, which is adding editing. As you can see, they're removing columns. Uh, so still a high level, but they can't really control the list at the extent we can. And then editing just items or just viewing. Sometimes you want to give someone like report level access to your list, and that would be that last one there. So four different levels, uh, then I would notify Isaiah, and I'll go ahead and give edit list access. Let's say we're going to collaborate pretty closely on this entire project. So Isaiah got that. Now, just like with the file, if you want to remove that at some point and make it private to you again, you just use the ellipsis, manage access, and then you can remove Isaiah's access. Right, so I'll pause there, and I'm going through a lot of introductory content. Are there any questions on anything that I've said so far? So this being in your OneDrive, are there are there any like implications or limitations that you really saw that that come from you know creating this in a OneDrive? Yeah, so I think the number one thing is going to be the same consideration we have with your documents, which is if you were to leave the company or, uh, you know, maybe promote out of the department, we have some decisions to make. Um, if you're leaving the company, your site's going to disappear eventually. So we need to figure out how to copy that over to a shared location, maybe. Now, if it's just really for you to work through your own processes, then not a big deal. But if your team has come to rely on it because you shared it with 30 people, <laughs> it's a little bit different scenario there. Right. Um, so that's one consideration. And then um, let's see. 
Oh yeah, and then if you promote out of the department, same kind of situation, you're gonna keep your OneDrive site. So you could keep that connected to those 30 people, but it's not ideal, right? Eventually it's just gonna be needed by somebody else. Somebody else is gonna want full control to take it over, but it's still tied to you individually. My guidance to my users is that there's just because you are building it doesn't make it yours. It's still corporate content and belongs on a shared site. It is only yours if it's yours personally, and if it were deleted, the only one that would compare care is you, then it can go on OneDrive. That's great. All right. And Any I other questions? Got my OneDrive, which I love. <laughs> All right. Let's keep going here then. Uh, so I'm going to zoom back out just a little bit. Um, I could show you how to share one item, but I just want to talk through it instead so we can move on. But basically, when you do start adding content to your list, um, and this goes for both your list and like SharePoint or Teams list, uh, you can share one individual item. And some people don't realize that, uh, so I like to share that little tidbit. Because imagine if somebody you know, submits a form, because we can use lists for like form-like experiences where they're submitting requests, perhaps. Uh, you could share that one item with an individual for them to just look at and say, hey, somebody requested this. Could you review the details and let me know if you have any concerns? So sharing one specific item to someone who may not be a part of your site or may not have access to the whole list, right? But now they can access that one row of data. So uh, we're kind of getting into some topics now that are going to start highlighting why you might want to choose lists instead of Excel. Um, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. But there's definitely a use case for both. And if you do want that kind of row level separation for some of your, your data, this is uh, going to be a clear front runner. And sometimes when I, when I say that, I get uh, a comment such as, well, why don't I just copy the row in Excel and send that to somebody? Well, that, that row, whenever we're copying and pasting and maybe sending in an email, for example, uh, that's static, right? And if the status of that row of data were to change, let's say from pending to approved, a link to that item would show that, right? You can click on it today, it says pending. Click on that same link tomorrow, it shows you it's approved. But that Excel row of data, I'm gonna have to copy and paste it again and send it. <laughs> so uh, a huge benefit, just giving people a live connection to a specific row of data or the entire list. So uh, Mickey, would you add anything to the my list before we move on to our list? No, not that I can think of. I mean, as far as functionality and limitations or lack thereof, um, they work the exact same way. So. Yep. Sweet. Oh, I guess I would say um, space might be consideration from a list perspective, um, the amount of data, although it doesn't matter where it's stored, you can easily allocate more space to a SharePoint site than you could um, technically the OneDrive site. So. If the list got huge, that might be a consideration as well. So my number one, this is why lists are better, and I will say it so much better than Excel, and Excel sucks for this, is because lists have line item version control. So if you have someone who's in an Excel spreadsheet, particularly if you have multiple contributors, so if someone comes in, they make some changes, somebody else comes in, makes more changes, somebody else comes in, makes more changes, and oops, you need to go back and undo that first person's changes. You can only do that by undoing everyone's changes by going to a previous version. Whereas with um, a SharePoint list, not only do you get you know, all the permissions and things that you're talking about here, but you have line item version control. So you can roll back a particular line item. Um, I have used it for when people come back to me and say, I don't know why I was tagged with that task. I don't own that resource. And then I look at the version control and say, well, in May of 2019, you listed yourself as the owner of said resource. So, yeah, um, <laughs> which doesn't I, I've used that. So so the line item version control is a huge, 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 huge lifesaver for me, both from um, an accountability standpoint um, and just, you know, error control, whatever you call that, fixing broken things. Yeah, well, definitely. And I guess in addition to that, um, Rachel, you bring up a good point that um, when we're comparing, again, lists in general, no matter where they're stored to in Excel, that line item control when it comes to Power Automate um, is just far, far above and beyond anything Excel can do because you can yeah. you know, do tons I of mean, work and stuff with that. Absolutely. And even if, and if we're you know going to go beyond just the specifics of the list experience versus the Excel experience, 
Um, you know, if you start talking about Power BI integration or Teams integration or any of this other stuff. Um, oh, I like the recycle bin that if someone does come in and accidentally or on purpose delete, you know, five lines, it you can get them back from the recycle bin, which again, you can't really do with Excel without go doing the version. Anyway, I love lists. <laughs> I have a whole SharePoint page on my user site on why lists are better than Excel. I, I can follow. send a screenshot. I'll stop now. Send us a <laughs> screenshot, Rachel. I'd like to see it. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, let's uh, switch gears a little bit, and we're going to switch into shared lists, where you're not starting on your own. Um, excuse me. You don't have to manually share as long as you're part of an existing site or team. So for the rest of uh, my piece, anyway, I'm going to use this retail accounts list, and the retail accounts list is part of a site called Retail. So I can see that from the URL. I see the URL doesn't say my or Alex anymore. Uh, and I can see up here right above the list name that it's part of a site called retail. So I get some context clues to find out right away if it's already shared with someone else. Now, you may not always go through the list app to get here. You may want to view this list in context of the site. So from here, if you did start in list like I did, just click on the name of the site. So right there where it says retail, click on that. It takes you onto the site. And then I've got my retail accounts link here. So it doesn't matter which way you go from, but this way it makes it obvious that you're you're in SharePoint. <laughs> All right. So here we are in SharePoint. This list actually has data. And just to kind of show um, some of the concepts that were just discussed, if we select any particular item, we use the ellipsis and go to version history. <coughs> Excuse me. All right the dry throat. <laughs> so uh, you can see all the changes that were made to this particular list item going back to April. Okay, every single change that was made. And it, it's not showing me every field unless there was a change in it. For example, I'm seeing display ready was changed to yes. Location was updated. Customer ready was changed to yes. The specific uh, fields that were updated as we went through time. Now, uh, if I want to restore one of those, let's say for this one row of data, for this one retail account, I want to go back to version nine, that specific timestamp or that specific change. Uh, I just drop that down and choose restore. If I just want to look at it to compare and see what the comments were or what the work was at that point, I can click view and it's just going to open up that that item and show me the different fields here as it was in that version. All right, and then just like with document libraries, I could go through all the steps um, if anybody's interested, but if you delete a specific version, let's say it had sensitive information like a social security number, but it shouldn't have or a credit card number, but it shouldn't have. You can delete one version of a list item and you can delete an entire item. So if I delete an item from my list, just like a document, it goes to my recycle bin from where, there we go, I can restore. So just select and restore. It works for versions, works for the entire list item as well. All right, uh, so some other topics here. Uh, what I'd like to kind of introduce is uh, views and metadata. And if you're not familiar with the term metadata, it's just data about data. So that's really what lists are, right? It's, it's mostly kind of like a database feel. And we start with one column, which is usually the key, right? It's the title field, and it tells us what is this entire row of data about? And so in this case, maybe it's actually store name. This entire row of data is about the retail account for Northwind Capitol Hill. And then every other column we created here has to do with that, right? So that's pretty basic. So, but the, the columns that we're adding here, so like last order, representative, and anything else that we wanted to add uh, is just additional data that we want to collect. And usually we want to add that data for a number of reasons, right? To know who to seek approval from, to know when we have to do something by, uh, maybe to do conditional formatting or create a view. Uh, so whether it's a, a functional thing or whether it's an aesthetic thing, uh, we, we've got options just because we're using metadata. So to give you some examples of what I just said, uh, whenever you're dealing with choices, for example, like this display ready and customer ready, and it's yes or no, or maybe customer status, uh, we can format those to make them stand out a little bit more and we can group by them and it's really easy we just use the column headers so i'm going to use display ready drop that down first i'll show you grouping group by display ready and now i've got a roll up right kind of my own little report view where i can say oh i've got three that aren't display ready and maybe i focus my work on those right or maybe i want to look at them side by side my nose and my yeses and anytime you're doing anything i'm about to show you the grouping filtering uh, formatting Remember that you can save these as a separate report view. So notice up in my upper right hand corner where I've got my all items view selected. 
um, I've got all these other reports or views that I've created based on things I'm doing just like I am now, right? Like grouping or changing formatting, uh, maybe changing what columns I want to see in a particular view. So just keep that in mind as a possibility. Now, in addition to grouping by that, maybe you want to do a little bit of color coding, right? So let's use customer ready and we'll do uh, just basically a yes or no, right? Yes or no, different colors. So I'm going to go to my column settings. Uh, we'll do format this column. And then if it's specifically a choice column, we do get the ability to do choice pills, which basically just puts a colored oval behind uh, the, the, the different options. But if it's not a choice field, you may just want to do conditional formatting. So let's go ahead and delete the default rule. And we'll say if customer ready is equal to yes, then we'll make it, yeah, we'll just go with blue. That sounds good. <laughs> I'm going to refresh since we're not seeing it right away. When in doubt, refresh, and there's my three yeses highlighted. So that's a very simple example. Um, but imagine that you know you could add multiple conditions and say uh, if the item is overdue and the status is not ready, right? Combine those two things, and then visually you can see everything that's overdue and not ready instantly, right? Uh, so that's just one example of formatting, and you can do it per column like that, or you could do it per row. So in addition to having column formatting, we can go up to our view menu and format views. And it's the same kind of concept. You can do conditional, you can do alternating, and then uh, basically create the same kind of rules and say if it's over a certain amount, highlight the entire row in red. So I'll pause there again. Any questions so far about the grouping or the conditional uh, formatting that I'm talking about? All right, cool. Let's keep going. So let's see, checking my time here. Let's go down here. OK, so I've got in this particular uh, view, I've got a really cool ability because I'm using a people column that allows me to make a specific experience for you, right? Uh, so if I actually look at my view menu, I've got my accounts as a view. And remember, my name is Alex right now in this demo. So I choose my accounts. And because I have that representative column, which is a real people column, I can get my own custom view, right? These are the only accounts that I care about. And then uh, Mickey's acting as Isaiah today. And if Isaiah goes to this exact same view, if I just send her this URL, then she's only going to see Isaiah's items, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So let me show you how I do that in case you haven't tried that before. Uh, but from my all items view, just my default view, I can drop down representative and go to filter by. And then there's an option here that's at me. Now, if I go down, I could find my name, Alex Wilbur, right? And I could check that and click apply and create my own maybe uh, private view if I wanted to, if I didn't want it to be public for the rest of my team. Uh, but the difference is if I choose Alex here, that's only ever going to show Alex. And if I did make a public view and Isaiah visited it, Isaiah is going to see Alex's stuff, right? So this is a static option. Whereas the at me is custom, right? It's going to be dynamic. And if you log in and you go to a view where I filtered by at me, you're going to see your items. So imagine the power of that if it's like stuff you created, stuff that's been assigned to you, stuff that's your responsibility, right? Or maybe if you're a manager, uh, all of your direct reports or things that you oversee, right? All right, so we'll go ahead and do that. We'll apply the at me and we get the same uh, view option, which uh, we haven't saved, but you know I've already created it, my accounts. So uh, as we're making changes like this, if you haven't worked much with views, you can always just drop down the view menu, save view as, and then you're going to be exactly where I was with that other one. All right, so let's talk about dates too. So you've seen me do um, an at me, you've seen me do some conditional formatting. Uh, we, we can also do rolling dates, and I really like this in uh, list versus Excel too. We can we can do it in either place, but I like it here best. <laughs> but uh, basically, with our with our date views, I've got a last order column, and I just want to see things that are in the last three months, recent orders, basically. And you could do this any number of ways. Think about things that are due in the next seven days, forms that were submitted in the last four months. You know, anything that has to do with a rolling date like that. And in this particular case, if I want to create something like that, I unfortunately, let me start from all items again, but I unfortunately can't do it from here. I can't drop down the, the column header and go to filter by and have some kind of relative option. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm, I'll show you from the view that I created, but basically you edit a view, create a new view, and then choose edit the current view. And then, there we go. 
We'll go all the way down here and there's a filter section. And in the filter section, we just say show items only when the following is true. And I'll zoom in a little bit there. Oops. And I said last order is greater than or equal to today minus 90, right? So about three months. Um, and I know to use today in brackets like that because it tells me off to the side. So if you forget that step, just remember to read the instructions today or me. Now, uh, just an FYI, if you're curious about that me, that's the same thing I just did with the at me. It's just a classic versus modern approach. Uh, so you don't have to come here to do this, but you could. You can absolutely come here and use that instead of an at me. Uh, but this is something we still need to do in classic. So I took today in brackets, minus 90. And as long as that last order date is within that range, it's going to show up in this view. All right. Uh, Mickey, do you have anything to add so far on the, the people or the, the date views or anything or scenarios you can think of you want to share? Um, yeah, just one scenario that I'd like to point out from kind of what I've learned <laughs> is um, in that filter view, um, when you're looking at dates, I know I've had, you know, project solutions or contract solutions or something along those lines that you're trying to capture both before and after a time frame. So you want, you know, like seven days worth or something like that. Um, just be careful if you go over like three filters um, because of your and and or situation. You want to remember your order of operations back in like middle school. If they still teach that in school. I don't know, but <laughs> um, just making sure that your and and ors work in the way you may even have to sometimes maybe flip what you initially thought you built first. Um, and I don't recommend going over more than two or three because it just never seems to to work. But you can see there as Nate is adding more and more and more. I think you can do up to like six or eight different filters. But it's if you have that many filters, my recommendation is use a calculated column or use Power Automate to some type, you know, to set some type of value or something and then filter off that value. Um, for those of you that might be familiar with like Excel if statements or something, you know, when you get into too many nested if statements, um, you can sometimes lose ultimately what you're trying to do. So it's kind of the same concept. Great. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Mickey mentioned something that's really great that I love, and it's calculated columns. And I like it so much that I created an hour-long presentation just on it <laughs> because we could talk about them all day. Uh, but calculated is just another column type. And basically, you know, of course, we can do mathematical uh, calculations, right? We could say take this amount times this amount or this minus this. Um, but I like to use it for more than that. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is to use it for dates, uh, where you can say days between, days until, something like that. Um, but I also like to just extract pieces of the date. For example, let's look at last order again. And if I wanted to have a view that showed me all of the orders per year or per quarter or something, you can do that using a calculated column. So if anybody's interested, I could give you a quick demo, but otherwise we'll keep moving on. But really cool uh, usage case, just to, again, create more than one view. Yeah, and if you aren't familiar with Excel formulas, they're almost, most of them are easily transferable with either no changes or very small changes into a SharePoint calculation. So they're very similar to, um, to Excel in that. And I love them as well and use them all the time. Yeah, I usually, um, so I, I adore lists in case you can't tell. Um, I adore them. Um, and one of the tidbits I usually tell my re tell readers, users, uh, friends, colleagues, is that when you're building a list, regardless of how you expect people to interface with it, whether you're going to put a power app on it or whatever or not, is to build as much functionality into the list itself before you even talk about forms or things like that. So if there are calculations that need to be made, do them in the list in a calculated column. You can do lots of them. Uh, as Mickey was saying, I have found very few things that can't be done you know, so on and so forth, but, but to build as much as you can into your list with your, you know, rules and things like that, and then see what needs to be done. If there's still functionality that you're missing, then go ahead and consider a Power App. I'll admit I am not a big fan of how complicated Power Apps are, and Power Apps, by the way, hate me, um, and so I despise them in return because they hated me first. Um, 
but you know build as much as you can into the list it's less you have to maintain in your power app it's less of a learning curve for your site owners so if you're building something on behalf of someone else it's much easier for them to maintain columns than it is to always go in and update fancy rules in your power apps and stuff um and and calculated columns are a huge 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 piece of this um they can get really complicated it's hard but it can be done yeah. nate we do have a question to see a quick calculated demo Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you want to create like a month off of that last order date. Yep, you got it. All right, so I'm going to go to add a column just like I normally would, but notice there's no calculated type here, so I have to choose more. And then we're back in classic world where it all began. <laughs> and I'm going to call this column month. OK, and I've got my calculated type, which enables me to add a formula. So just make sure you choose calculated first, or of course you won't see that. And what I do, and there's a hundred different ways you could do this or more probably, but <laughs> the way that I prefer to do this is a way that sorts well, because I want to be able to use ascending and descending sort on this column and still have it work. So because I'm going to use a text function, and again, you could do this a number of ways, but because I'm going to use text, that means for my sort to work, I need to start with the year, right? So I'm going to do year, month, and then spell it out. Um, so you'll see what I mean here in just a second. But basically, um, I'll write the uh, formula out here, and I can also paste it in the chat for you here in just a moment. But it's going to be a text, and then I find that column that I'm looking for, in this case, last order. Okay, And then I do a comma, and then this is where you specify the format. So because I want sortable, I'm going to use my quotation marks to begin it, and then it's going to be YYYY for the year, month, month. So that part's easy. But then in parentheses, I'm going to spell out the whole name of the month. So I'm going to do four M's for the full name, three M's for the abbreviated, like J-A-N for Jan, okay, or January. Now I'm speaking in abbreviations. <laughs> Close my quotations, and actually I'm going to spell it out all the way. There we go. Close my parentheses, leave it as text, and okay. And there we go. So this is how it's going to uh, look. I've got my, um, the name of the, or sorry, the year, the month, and then spelled out. So when I sort, I say A to Z, there you go, got my earliest first. Now I don't stop here, I usually group by this, so then I can expand and collapse based on the month. So I would uh, drop down the header again, group by month, and then I've got my nice report, right? I can roll that up and see, since this is such a small list that it's not very interesting, but <laughs> you can imagine if you had 3,000 rows of data, how nice this would be to be able to roll up those very specific last order dates into a month or into a quarter, right? Uh, using something that you could see was very much like what we would do in Excel, just like Mickey was saying. So yeah, let me uh, paste that into the chat for you too. And while I'm doing that, any other uh, questions on that? It looks like Alan had a question from before, and I'm sorry, Alan, that we, I didn't pay attention to that, but um, he was just asking about how to um, do the offline mode of the lists, because I know that is actually a newer feature um on lists mm -hmm. yeah you know i haven't really tried offline myself has anybody else in the user group tried that maybe not well sounds like we all have some learning to do <laughs> i, I also see it. not tried it either yeah <laughs> yeah all right so we'll, we'll look that up maybe we can follow up again all right but I haven't been traveling, and so that's normally when I do offline stuff is while I'm on a plane or a train or whatever. So, yeah. so Alan had mentioned that it was just rolled out this month, even so it's something that's fresh. Nice. I knew that's it was better. I was actually going to question whether it's even fully rolled out yet or not because I don't think I've seen it. Um, yeah. My... Early release I... tenants. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but we're usually on the later side of anything gets rolled out, so. I'm not even looking. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm, I'm Alan inviting up. you back to next month. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just wrap up my piece here by showing you a couple more ideas for views, not in too much detail, but just to get the wheels turning on some different ideas. I um, mean, you saw one when we did our intro, which was a list view like you're seeing right now versus a gallery view where it was more graphic or more card like. Right, so let me show you in this specific list. If I just change my style, which is up here at the top from list to compact list, that looks a little tighter, right? And I lost all those horizontal lines that maybe looked a little messy. 
uh, but there's also the gallery view, which is what you saw in our intro slide. And these gallery views can, uh, instead of just being a personal style for you, can be built into an actual permanent view that you share with your team. So for example, I've got a, a grouped by representative view where I can see kind of what we saw with the date, but I did something similar where I've got my, I think it's display ready. There we go. Where I can uh, view, you know, still the representative as my first piece of info on those cards, but I've decided to group those cards by yes and no on display ready. All right, so you can kind of uh, imagine some use cases for that, but really whenever you have like product images, site images, anything that's graphic heavy, you can actually put that at the very top of the card like our intro slide did. So a nice visual option. And then one other uh, view uh, possibility here, when you go to click create new view, I'll just show you real quick, you can choose the gallery you just saw or calendar. And you can use the calendar view as long as you have a date field in your um, list, which every list has created and modified but you'd probably use it if you had another field that's more important to you, such as order date. So now I can see on a calendar that on the 22nd, um, which is in the future, so that's a fun date <laughs> for last ordered, right? Um, but anyway, I've got that on my calendar and I can go up month by month and look for the other order dates and see that Coho Downtown made an order. And I can still edit these items. I just double clicked on that and I can change the details and everything, but I'm navigating it in a calendar format. All right, um, so Mickey, before I hand it over to you, I just want to do one quick thing, and that's create a small view, which doesn't have as many columns so that it can be better utilized in some uh, web parts. So I'm going to create a new view, call it summary, Oops. leave it as a list format and create. There we go, and then I'm going to edit it. And then basically I'm just going to take out a bunch of columns here. So just choose what's important. So I'm doing a demo, obviously, but you would choose the most important pieces of data here. Okay, and then I'll click OK. And now I've got my small view. So uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mickey, who's going to talk to us about how we can take this even further and integrate it into our other digital workplaces. Yeah, I love those smaller views um, because they're very handy for if you have like field um, employees or you, you know mobile access. It's just a little bit easier to consume um, if you don't see all those columns. Um, you can still open the item as Nate has showed numerous times to see all the actual real data on that. So, all right. Um, so, from a basic SharePoint uh, list, not SharePoint, sorry, list component, um, Nate showed you what I would consider almost like an introductory or, you know, a getting started. Um, from that level, then let your users get used to working in the list itself before, you know, because they're already making a big change from probably Excel or something like that, um, maybe even email or Word, <laughs> you know, whatever process you guys are using now, um, getting them used to lists um, and working in them and changing out the views and editing items and looking at the version history and all of that kind of stuff. Once you have your team has you know been a little bit more established and you're ready to take it to the next level, there are endless opportunities when it comes to Power Apps and Power Automate and um, even visualization when it comes to Power BI and connecting um, SharePoint lists to that as well. So just to kind of do more demo and a brief introductory to some of those, um, I want to share with you here. Um, all right, so we're at the I'm trying to remember what I've created. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a help deck help desk ticketing system. And one of the things that I love um, nowadays with this kind of modern um, and Microsoft 365 groups, is that we can take our ticketing systems that we've created over the years for those of us that have been in SharePoint um, and we can take it to the next level because now the Microsoft 365 groups um, incorporate a calendar and they incorporate a shared mailbox. And so, you know, your, your end users can send an email um, to a help desk mailbox and that email can then be generated and create an actual ticket in a SharePoint list and then, you know, go on from there, whatever that flow looks like. So kind of giving you an idea here of um, what these ticketings look like. You can see here um, conditional formatting. We've got some you know pills and different colors and things on this list. 
We also have an assigned to column so that we're actually assigning those tickets. Um, and again, once those tickets are assigned, that can generate an email um, or some type of notification. Maybe it's a Teams message or, or something along those lines. Well, one of the things that I actually like to do with um, the help, like a true request or help desk ticketing system is to actually customize the form itself. And um, when you are on an item, you see here, and we open and look at this item, the form is compiled of all of these, you know, different columns. Now you can get really complicated and you can go into power, um, power apps and do a buku, but you know, buku amount of things there. And as someone who used to be an InfoPath designer back when that was relevant, um, you know, power apps has just kind of blow my mind as far as what the um, capabilities are. And I think even, you know, maybe it was Rachel that mentioned before, sometimes um, it's just almost more complicated than I think it needs to be in some in some ways. Um, so just showing here, you can see I can actually edit the form itself. And we used to do this through content types, which is still relevant um, on that side of things. But you can see here I can edit, configure the layout or even customized with um, a power app. So if I'm, you know, configuring the, the layout here, um, you know, I can change my columns and, and where they're laid out and do some, some coding and, and some body and things. Obviously, this isn't necessarily, um, it's light code, <laughs> not no code options. And then, just even to more simply than that is um, sometimes I want to edit my columns and I don't want certain columns seen to the actual requester. Um, one of the examples is that we just did um, revamped our marketing requests um, at here at Centric. And, um, and so the users that are going to be making requests to the marketing department, they only have a small amount of columns um, that we want them to fill in as far as the data that we're getting. Um, so maybe it's description. Um, we don't maybe want category or progress. Uh, maybe we want priority, start date, due date, uh, but we don't want to sign to and we don't want notes because the notes um, are for the team that's going to actually be handling the request itself. So as I kind of work through these items here, I'm not deleting those columns. I'm hiding them from the original, um, what we call the new form itself. And so you can see here what it looks like. Now we've just got a very simple form for our users to enter in information. And then our team on the back end once uh, can go in and, and use the views to see those columns. So you can see here, priority and progress and even the assigned to didn't go away. Those columns are still there. But if I was to put a button on a page or embed this form in, you know, to all my company, you can see I've got just a short amount of columns that we want to make sure they're filling in um, because they're not going to assign the ticket to someone or they're not going to, you know, maybe put a progress on there. All the tickets are defaulting to new until the team members go and actually, uh, you know, format all of that kind of stuff. And to kind of give you another um, example of that, on this give website that I have here, I've got a volunteer today button. And so, um, you know, I wanting to volunteer. And so I'm going to click this little button on our SharePoint page. It's going to take me to the list itself, I can click new. All right, my name and I'm going to use Alex for this because I've already volunteered, so I'm signing him up. And we'll just say he's interested in cats. Any any contribution or any volunteer um, around cats is what his he's interested in. So a really simple form, just two fields. I click save. As far as I'm concerned, I'm done. But from the HR team or the maybe the community engagement team or whatever the case may be, there's actually a workflow working on the, in the background of this. Uh, we'll give this just a minute here to um, get this workflow working. Of course, hopefully this live demo works. <laughs> it did work this morning, so we'll see. Um, you can see here right now it's unassigned. 
because what's happening is the manager and the department field is being brought in through the workflow itself. You can see down here um, that when Isaiah, who I'm playing today, um, interested in children and it brought in uh, my manager and the department that I was in. So those are two fields that I didn't necessarily have to fill in when I was making the initial requests because we already have access to those through our Azure Active Directory. And so I was able to pull those in through the Power Automate option. Looks like it's taking just a little bit long, of course. The demo guides are not with us today. So, uh, but that kind of gives you a little idea of how to just change those forms um, to kind of drive what it is you want your users to fill in. And then, you know, if there's an additional second team or whatever, um, or even approval process might work the same way. Um, you can definitely customize those things without going through the whole Power Apps side of things. The Power Apps is great, but sometimes it's just a little too much oomph um, <laughs> for it. it. This is one of the best things that Microsoft has done for lists, from my opinion, in a long, long time. Because so again, in my situation, I am frequently building things for other people. So I get people who aren't really SharePoint experts. You know, they need a tool. I am the SharePoint expert, so I build them a tool and I need to be able to hand it off to them, right? And if they're not a SharePoint expert, it's not hard to teach a novice how to add a new column, particularly since you can do it from the UI now. You know, I can teach them very easily how to go in and if you need to move it around, edit columns, right? Um, I've got a page, you know, that is like, if you want to conditionally show and hide it, use this exact syntax, just replace these red parts right here. I can do that with the most novice user and they can get their tool working. They can feel confident, competent, um, and I can easily hand it off to them. You know, Power Apps is not, again, Power Apps hates me, but you know, whatever. Um, but that's just not something I can do. Power Apps is super cool, but there's no way I can hand off a tool with a Power App to someone who's not a specialist. They, that I will own that for the rest of my time. Um, right. So this is this is honestly one of the best things um, that they've done. That and the new rules thing um, are are some of the best updates they've done to lists in a long time. I love you, Microsoft. Thank you. <laughs> I 100% um, agree with you, Rachel. I can just remember my InfoPath days where I've created you know three or four different uh, forms. Um, the new forms, the edit forms, the customized forms, you know, for various things. And this is really all I needed in probably 80% of those solutions. Um, but because the tools that we had available to us were just so complicated. And, um, we had yeah, to if they would just allow us to do a cascading field with this. I would, would never have to touch power apps like ever again. I, I agree. Yep. If anyone has me pull in that area. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to vote on that one too. So, um consider me a second vote um for that capabilities as well. You can see here our um Power Automate has actually finished working while we're discussing some of that. So, you can see it pulled in uh Miriam, we both have the same um manager, but we're in two different departments there. So, um, just a little bit of um, information there. One of the other things that Rachel did mention here that I was going to get to is the new integration, uh, or I should say automation of creating a rule. Um, in a SharePoint list, we've always had the ability to create alerts, and I still feel like those alerts um, can be relevant in some situations. It's a really good way for your users to take control over the information and the emails that, that they're getting, even if you've got some type of you know, flow that's generating something or, or whatever the case may be. Um, this is a second option in addition to the alerts, um, and it just kind of allows you to kind of dive in a little bit further um, and get a little bit more specific. There are limitations to this. This isn't something that I'm going to create, you know, an entire workflow around um, because it's a very simple thing. And if you can create an Outlook rule, you can create a rule in your list. So again, this is a very user-based side of um, notification systems that they can customize um, that you wouldn't even have to do necessarily yourself. Um, and it's really pretty, pretty simple. I think self-explanatory. A lot of times you're just going to say when a value in a certain, you know, cell almost like Excel has changed, 
do something, send me a notification or change something or, or whatever the case may be. Um, obviously, you can see we've got some other options here when a new item is created, when is something is deleted. Those are you know very similar to the alerts that we can do now, um, but more often than not, I'm finding that I use this as an option uh, for most of my users. You can see here, it's a very simple statement. Choosing a column, you know, my name, choose what that condition is, you know, is, and then enter the value. So this is where you want to make sure, obviously, that the values match, um, whatever that is. And then, as you can see, this is where the limitations come from. It's a very simple, you know, statement as far as what it's going to do. So am I going to send an email to an individual and am I going to send an email to a group mailbox um, or something along those lines? You can do either in this case. Um, so keep that in mind. But yeah, just based on, you know, if I if I were going to use a different column type or data type, um, then my, you know, my options may change here if it was a number or if it was a date or something along those lines. You can get greater than or less than or equal to in here if it's the data type is correct in the column that you've chosen. But this is another way that you can empower your users to take control over what notifications and things that they're getting. If the overall flow isn't working or maybe you have, you know, someone is on vacation and so someone else is filling in for them and you've built this whole long power automate and it's notifying that individual. Well, now they're on vacation. <laughs> you don't want to change your flow. Um, and so this would be a way for someone that fills in to actually get notifications um, in the steps that they need to get notifications on. So very, very helpful in that. When we are looking at the put a null, do you know if it's possible to put a null value in there or say like if it is not null? So what I frequently have is you know a field that's empty when the item is created, and then when it gets filled in with any value, please go notify someone. So what I'd like to do is have if it is you know not null, send an email to somebody. Yeah, I try. I, I know what you're talking about because I've tried myself. It, at this point in time, that's not there, but I foresee this growing. Um, yeah, you know, I use it all the time for the same reasons that I use the rules, the yeah. learning curve. So, and that again, that one little piece I'm missing is the I need people to be notified when that field gets filled in. Mm -hmm. I yeah. look at this when I when I talk to you know Microsoft folks or when I talk to um, clients and things like that. You know, a lot of my clients are, you know, using like Monday.com um, or something along those lines. And so when I started seeing some of these capabilities on the SharePoint list, um, I'm starting to see what Monday.com can do. Um, and so I feel like, you know, that it, this functionality started going to start to grow because they brought lists out from SharePoint made it its own you know, application, hoping that users, more general business users, will start using it to track information like they're doing on these other applications um, that are you know, costing companies money, and, uh, but just gave a user way of controlling a workflow that didn't involve you know, complicated steps. So, um, well, I mean, Power Automates brings you into the, into the whole concept of service accounts and things because, you know, what happens if the person who writes it leaves the company, which is my big beef with Power Automate. I mean, the, changes. the most, you know, a basic one-step Power Automate has all these issues. Um, so, you know, the more we can do with these basic, hey, I just need to know when someone fills in this field, you know, that sort of thing. The rules, I think, are filling a huge gap, um, but I just need that one piece. I need cascading fields and I need you know, when a field is not null, and then yep. I would be happier. <laughs> I completely agree. And those are two very common scenarios because I've even come across them multiple times um, myself as well. Um, so going back to some of the other things that you can do with your list here, you can see that I've built um, a very basic dashboard for this demo. Um, and I don't have a Power BI license. So this is, I mean, I do have a Power BI license in this <laughs> environment, but you know, from a from a user standpoint or even from a site owner perspective, um, you know, they may not necessarily have that Power BI license um, or may not know how to do Power BI for that matter. So we do have some capabilities here um, on a SharePoint page itself to build in what are called web parts. It's um, the chart web parts. And you can put really as many as you want on a page. 
Um, you can see here I've just used that same web part three different times and um, pulled in, you can, from our ticketing system here, pulled in some data just to get some visualization or some, you know, maybe a management overview or whatever it is that you want to call um, from, from this information. Now, one of the things that I do want to point out is um, if you are using one of these pages and let's see here, I'm trying to find my page that I was going to do. I think it's here. All right, well, we'll just create one for the class. So if we look over here, we have account managers list, we have a retail accounts list, and we have a product sales list. Um, the caveat um, around using these web parts is your list has to be kind of um, eligible for the chart. Um, so if we create our dashboard here, okay, I'll just delete this. I'm going to choose my web parts here. I've been chart. There's our quick chart web part. And what I've done on the page on the previous dashboard is I did make it a three column and then used that web part three times. But for this purpose, um, put some shading behind there so you can focus on what it is here. I'm going to edit this web part. And one of the things that I want to say is if you get data from a SharePoint list, you may be surprised to only see one list listed, even though this particular SharePoint site actually has three. And the reason why is because the um, two of the lists don't actually have any values or any number columns in them. So I can manually enter data in here, but of course then you're updating that manual data on a regular basis. So there is a lot of limitations to this, but for those of you that don't have Power BI, this is one way to kind of get around that and still have it almost a dashboardy type of thing. One of the things that I would recommend is using calculated columns to represent number values in your list, even though your users are, you know, using a drop down menu, maybe for progress or for status or something along those lines. If you give it a number value using a calculated column, that would more than likely then um, make your list eligible for these charts, which would then give you that dashboard kind of look. So you can see here out of the three lists, we only have one list that's eligible. Okay. And we're going to select that list and then I'm going to choose what it is columns that have the data to display. And again, there's a lot of columns in this list that aren't listed here and it's because they're not a number of values. So just keep keep in mind that that limitation there. Um, and then our column label. So what are we actually labeling? Do I want to see the postal codes? Probably not. I probably want to see the store name um, so that I actually get a little bit better visualization around all of that. Okay, and then again, you can sort these um, by ascending, descending, or we'll do the ascending label. That way our store names are alphabetical on that. Uh, you can see here I've chosen a chart, but we do have a pie chart option as well. Um, and really, I mean, it's just a simple, they're very simple charts, um, but they sometimes just get the job done if needed, right? So we'll just say these are our store sales targets or whatever your title wants to be once i'm done um with you know building out that dashboard and whatever else i need to then i'm just going to save that publish that out and then i can easily use these little things here to announce or communicate with my users and my company what this page is maybe i want to turn it into a news post so that it rolls up to the sharepoint homepage for all of your users maybe i'm just wanting to add it to my navigation or something like that so that we can easily find it because it's just such a small team focused page. But you can see here, you know, I've got just some basics um, hovering capabilities and seeing what these numbers are and, and things like that. Um, now with our dashboard, um, I've also, you know, put in a couple of other things like meeting our top performers for the month. Um, and then what I also did was I added a the, the list itself in a web part. But I also added the connector web parts so the list properties. Um, what this does for us, so you can see here, as I select an item in my list, my little form over here is populating the data around that information. So to what Nate had mentioned before, um, if I wanted to change the view so that maybe only one or two columns show in this list view, 
then I can display all the details around that item in a connected list property or um, web part. So I'm going to go ahead and edit this page again and just really quickly show you what that looks like as well. You won't have the limitations as far as which lists are eligible for that um, that you do on these charts. So you can see right there, um, a list is the first web part that I used. And I what I want to do is change my subject so that I can get these side by side here. Uh, maybe a one third right. And again, maybe we'll put some color behind there to get some some differential. So um, we'll do our product sales list on this. And again, I probably want to shrink down how many columns I'm showing in this list form, because really the purpose of this is um, maybe it's like an ID number or like a ticket number or something that you're actually showing in the list. Um, because when you then select on it, that's when you're actually going to see the properties over there on the right hand side. Okay, so we'll get over here and there's that list properties web part. And so we have to make the connection. So you can have multiple of these. You can have them, you know, multiple lists on one page, and then you just want to make sure that the properties are actually connected to the correct list that you're wanting. So I'm just going to click connect. And that's not working. So we'll connect over to here to a source. Choose our product sales. Selected item here. Uh, this is where I can decide which columns I want to see on the form itself. Um, so maybe I don't show the notes column in the list. Maybe the notes column is here because it's maybe a big notes column or something like that. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and republish this page here. Now when I click on an item, you can see there I can get some more detailed information around that. There's not obviously a lot here in this list, but uh, you can see it's populating based on what item was selected on there. All right, it looks like, yeah, we have some, um, maybe a Power BI. I do actually have an example for Power BI. Um, let me just find that here. So this is where I, this particular, this is something that I've done way before. <laughs> this Power BI was created in Power BI and connected to the SharePoint list itself. I'm not really gonna go into the details around that because it's a little more complicated, but um, then I embedded, the Power BI on a SharePoint page, as you can see. So we've got our, my screen's freezing up here. There we go. Um, you know, we've got our, our numbers and all of our different things, and I could have drill downs. You can see here, if I embedded drill downs into each one of these images that would be available and actually functionable on the SharePoint page itself. If I wanted to select, uh, you know, one of these items, I, it does, you know, filter and, and work very similar to what a live Power BI page uh, would do. Um, and so, yes, you can see here it's all, they're all spinning and changing based on the selections that I've made. So Power BI does work um, embedded on a SharePoint page. And then even what we can do on, on top of all of that is then we can bring in Power BI into Teams or and or we can bring in um, the SharePoint pages that we've done with the charts. We can bring in the list itself um, inside this Power BI. So for instance, if I go into my general and refresh my author reports. I should not see my, there we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here's that sales report Power BI. Uh, it does take a while, just a little bit to load up um, that Power BI dashboard there. And I think we already have the list in here too. Let me see if I can find it, but maybe not. I'll just go ahead and add it over here. So in, you pick whatever um, channel you want to display. Add your tab. And there's, again, because we're talking kind of about SharePoint as well as lists, um, there's there's two different tabs that you could create for this. So we're going to start with our lists. So choosing the list and like Nate had mentioned, when you create a list from inside Teams, you actually get a couple of other templates that are available for you. So I'm just going to click save. And then I'll get my 
either create or an existing in this case. So we've already built the list from the list apps uh, that Nate had done earlier. Otherwise, we could create this list straight here from Teams. Okay, so here's our one example, or we can copy and paste a link here to another list that we wanted to. Okay, so there is our tabbed SharePoint list um, in there. Okay, and again, all the views and things that we've created, you can see here we created a grouped view as well. We could make that grouped view a default view. So that when they come in here, they see, you know, something along the lines of this versus, you know, all the data exposed um, row by row. However you want that to be seen, that's the best way is to do that through the views um, that Nate has showed you guys how to use before. Um, the other option that we have, because we didn't put a lot of um, content onto our SharePoint pages, is um, the, our SharePoint application. So if I want to actually show the page itself, like maybe the dashboard page where, it, you know, it's got a couple of components on there. Um, this is where I would do that. You can see here I've got recommended. I literally can click on pages that will just give me all the pages for this site. Um, lists. Again, this would just be another way. I recommend if you're going to show the list itself using the list app because it just displays better that way, um, or even a library for that matter. But we're going to use pages and we're just going to show that dashboard page that we created. And so that's one in particular had the Power BI on there, but if it was, you know, our help to ticketing or, or whatever the case might be, then you can see here we've got the actual embedded SharePoint page um, from that. And so if I think. So while we're while we're talking about Power BI and things like that, I'm going to go back to my things that you can do that don't require a license and stuff. Um, one of the issues we have with Power BI, at least in Rockwell, is that access to Power BI reporting is controlled separately from SharePoint, so which makes it a disaster for trying to put it on here. So the, the charting is nice, um, but they're kind of simple. Um, I put some stuff in the chats and some screenshots. There's actually Power BI integrated into your list in the integrate menu now. Um, so you can do your Power BI reporting directly from that list. Um, it doesn't require special permissions or anything like that. Um, if you were going to try and put it in a Teams channel, you'd have to use a website connector uh, tab rather than a, a SharePoint tab. Um, but if you need Power BI style reporting with, you know, all the cool things there, um, but don't want to go into the whole Power BI licensing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, like I said, in our case, we have to manage access. So just because you have access to my SharePoint site does not mean you get to see my Power BI reporting, which just don't go there. Just don't go there. But anyway, um, so in your list, you can go to the integrate menu, go to Power BI, build a report, super easy, right off that list, um, and share it. And and what I like most about it is that the access is controlled by SharePoint. So anybody who has access to your list has access to that Power BI report. So yay for people who are lazy. Don't have to manage that access separately. I agree. And, and if you're still old school, um, maybe you don't want to try out Power BI just yet, um, or you just love Excel because you're Excel guru, you can export these to Excel and there is a data connection connected to the Excel. It's a one way push. Um, Excel doesn't talk back to SharePoint uh, or to the list for that matter. So if you make changes in Excel, it doesn't change the list. But any changes in the list, if you set your workbook to refresh upon opening, um, that's another way because then there's a file viewer web part that you can put on a SharePoint page and then, you know, put it in Teams or, or display the Excel, um, you know, inside Teams um, itself. And so you can use, it comes through um, in a table. So pivot tables, charting, you know, all of your fancy Excel um, capabilities um, can be used. And I've even, um, done additional calculation columns in Excel, um, you know, as as a row, and it doesn't remove 
like anytime you refresh your content from what's happening in SharePoint into the Excel, if you've got additional columns in Excel, it doesn't remove those columns. So you can, you know, whatever, maybe a calculation or something that you can't do in, in SharePoint and you're just using it for reporting capabilities, you could do that in Excel too, if you're not like a Power BI wizard or whatever. Um, so that just so I know that's, that's an option too. You have to physically open the file to refresh the data. That's yeah, the one limitation. The data gets stale immediately unless you and you have to open the file. File viewer doesn't count. Or go under the data and click refresh all. But the, yeah, if, you still have to open the file though. No, not necessarily. Not if you set the the file itself um, to so that you can see the bar and they can you know like as long as they have edit rights, of course to the file itself. There's um, in Excel, there's a refresh all option. So you can just force the refresh um, inside the file itself. Another reason to use lists instead of Excel, just saying. Well, yeah, no, this is the example is that you're still using the SharePoint list. You're just visualizing the list in a dashboard using Excel. So if you don't have um, <clears throat> the AI knowledge on that. Hey, just as a time check, hey John, just to make sure, I wanted to make sure that you know whoever, if you, I think you have somebody that's presenting today. Yep. Yeah. So we we have a few more minutes, so we'll, we'll let uh, Mickey kind of finish up. Uh, Alex uh, needs about a half hour, so we're about right on schedule. Perfect. Awesome. This yeah, is great. I've had so much fun. I've learned a lot. I mean, I I knew like the old list kind of deal, but you know, kind of seeing this all the new features is really exciting. And Nate, was there anything that you felt like I didn't cover that you wanted to cover? Yeah, no, I think that was really great. Um, it's just hopefully it's clear how much you could do. Um, List to me is like one of the most flexible things that, that's out there. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? I know we've gotten some throughout um, everything, but that's pretty much all I had. When it comes to like formatting and such, do you guys see, you know, best practices or, you know, ways of not making it crazy? I mean, you know, the ones that you get as far as a template, I think they do a good job of kind of separating it out. But then I've seen where, you know, an end user takes over and I'm like, whoa, this thing's like a rainbow. There's nothing that's actually jumping out because everything jumps out. Do you guys have any like high level tips or things that you've seen that that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, it's nice that they do the the pills and everything for um, the, the choice columns and all of that. But personally, I don't like exactly what you're saying is that every single thing has a color. So just like I showed today, I could have chosen uh, pills for the yes, no, which is a very simple example. But instead, I just did conditional formatting and chose what I wanted to have color. Um, so in some cases, it makes sense, like the priority sometimes, just using little icons and things, that's fine. But yeah, if you're doing any kind of color coordination or view formatting, uh, you have to pick per view what's going to be most important, because you don't want to put everything that's important on one view. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And one of the things that I, I've had conversations with users that have just gone crazy is um, maybe spread them out across multiple views. So, to, so to, to what Nate was saying, you know, what is it that this view is that we're focusing on? Is it, you know, open tickets? Okay, which one of those are, you know, past due and which ones are high priority? And those are the only two factors that we look at as far as visualization or conditional formatting inside that view. Then what's the other view that we're looking at? Maybe it's something different or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, maybe just having a conversation with the users that are getting a little crazy and, and asking them to maybe split them, you know, split those colors into various views um, so that there's just maybe one or two things focused on each. Yeah, I've started talking to people about about that because, you know, if you highlight the entire page of your textbook, then it's all yellow now and you can't tell what's important. Um, so what I've started telling people is that for the fields where you want there to be those pills, those colors, what we're calling them. Go ahead and do that from the UI where it applies those colors automatically, which is super nice. Um, but if you don't want the colors in that field, it then be it becomes a real pain to have to remove them all the time. So for those fields, I tell people that they should instead create their columns the old way under list settings, where you go to list settings, create column and do it the old way, because that way the colors aren't applied. Um, and it's just 
because I'm lazy and it's easier than having to like click no color, no color, no color, no color, no color, because I'm lazy. Um, that's that's the advice I've been giving the same advice, you know, be choosy about what you use your color on. Um, and then that determines how you should create the column or how much time you spend removing all the colors. I just like to make the rainbows. <laughs> One other little tip that I would say is um, if you have two or three different views and you find that maybe your users aren't using them um, or they're not, they don't know about them, is link them on the left hand side so that they're actual links um, that they go to. So for them, they may not, they may think they're all different lists for that matter. I mean, we can trick our users sometimes <laughs> into thinking whatever we want. Um, based on, you know, linking and, and things like that. So. I like that. Great. Yeah, so as, as Anthony was mentioning, we'll uh, just from a time check, we'll just we'll keep moving um, and should be a little bit of time at the end for for more discussion as well. But thank you, Nate and Mickey uh, for that section. So uh, in the in part two now, Alex is going to jump in. Um, Alex and I are from Obsidian um, in the Milwaukee area, uh, even though Alex is not, he's in a warmer climate. <laughs> so uh, welcome Alex uh, to the group, uh, but he's gonna kind of go into a few more things with you know, the site templates and the scripting and some of the, the ways to apply some of these, these lists um, uh, in different ways. Go ahead, Alex. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Give me one second while I share my screen here. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to be presenting on um, using site templates and site scripts for site provisioning in modern SharePoint. And my name is Alex Lorenzo. Uh, I am a former healthcare administrator clinician who is now in the uh, SharePoint development or platform development space. Um, a little bit more about my background. So essentially I was practicing for 10 years um, as a board certified behavior analyst, pr primarily working with uh, individuals with developmental disabilities, usually age zero to 22. Um, and in that capacity, uh, being a clinician and running the organization, my organization started to expand and I wanted to always keep it paperless as it is a um, very data oriented data collection heavy uh, practice, psychology practice. So around the time where I founded my company was when Microsoft 365 started to uh, grow and Power Platform started to um, uh, get implemented. So I taught myself how to use that and incorporated that into our practice and our paperless technologies. Um, and that's how I got my experience with the Power Platform and um, Microsoft 365. Uh, feel free to email me, alexlorenzo at obsidian.com, and uh, that's my LinkedIn. So, let's see here. There we go. So, first of all, site templates, they are um, site templates and scripts. You want to use them to automate uh, provision of new or existing modern SharePoint sites. So important to, to note that this is applies for modern SharePoint sites um, and you can customize the configurations, right? So what this does is that it ensures consistency um, across the creation of sites using, you know, business branding or um, application of, of themes or uniform lists that you want to have across every site that's created, you could use site templates and site scripts to do such a thing. Uh, now, the documentation is pretty good on the Microsoft website. Um, you might see a lot of blog posts and everything referring, uh, referring this as a site design. It has been renamed it as site template. Uh, for those of you that have been around at SharePoint, for a couple of years, you'll know that in the past it was site templates and then they came out with site designs and then now site designs have been renamed to site templates. Um, so you could do all the things that I mentioned with site templates. And site scripts, including triggering power automate flows. So whatever you can't do or you're limited to not being able to do 
you could trigger a Power Automate flow from the running of a script that could then, um, you know, finish it, finish everything off with the customizations that you'd like. So some samples. Um, a site template consists of multiple site design, um, site scripts. Um, site scripts have multiple actions in them that tell SharePoint what uh, customizations to apply. So Microsoft has certain uh, out of the box samples as of templates that you could apply. Now, one thing to note here is that when you're applying a template, they are specific to whether you have a site, uh, a team site or a communication site. So you see that Microsoft has uh, event planning, project management, training and courses, and training and development team site templates. Um, and these are, are beautiful. So you could always apply these or extract the um, site script of these site templates and modify them accordingly if you want to expand on them. Uh, the communication site has uh, natively crisis management, department, leadership connection, learning central, and new employee onboarding. And you'll see here that you see a section for, these are the ones that are from Microsoft, these are from your organization. So we're going to go through using PowerShell to create a site script, adding that site script to our site template, and then come, navigating to uh, this UI and applying the site template by clicking the from your organization, and we should see it available there. So as I mentioned before, a site template contains one or more site scripts, right? And site scripts are made up of predefined actions that are executed after the site is created. So a site, a team site or a communication site is created. They're created with the default Microsoft SharePoint template. Um, for example, topic is one of is is one of the default templates. And then from there, you can apply your own custom template or one of the Microsoft defined ones that we just showed. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, they most of them, most of this, the scripts affect the site itself, but you could also trigger custom actions using Power Automate. So let's say you've applied a site template and now you want to send the Teams notification to an administrator that the site template was applied or this site was created. Um, you could do so, or you could send a trigger to um, trigger PMP provisioning and do some more advanced capabilities and and SharePoint site modifications that you can't do out of the box with site scripts or site templates. <clears throat> So how to apply the site template as we saw on the previous screen. In order to get to that section, you have to. In order to get to the screen that shows the templates, you have to click on the settings icon in the top right, and then there'll be a link that says apply a site template, and that's where we get to this screen. Again, after the site is already created is when we'll see that. <clears throat> So the anatomy of a site script, remember multiple site scripts to one site template. So a site script, it consists of verbs and uh, of verbs, CMD lets, right? Verb command lets and our verb JSON, uh, JSON objects, right? And they, what is a verb? It's essentially an action telling the script what to do, what to customize, right? These actions are applied in order. So from top to bottom. So we could see here that in this example, this site script applies a theme called Contoso Explorers. And then it and then this verb it creates a SharePoint list called customer tracking, in which that SharePoint list has sub actions. So this verb is an action, this verb is an action, but then we have sub actions within the verb with other verbs, right? So 
now this in this SharePoint list, we're setting the description. We're adding a SharePoint field called customer name. We're adding a SharePoint field called requisition total. We're adding a, a user SharePoint field type called contact, and we're creating a, a multiple line of text called note. Site scripts are non-destructive in in application. So what does that mean? That means if I have a, if I'm creating this customer tracking list and I apply this site script and now I, and now I have these four columns of requisition total, customer name, user, and note, and I apply it. Now, if I go in and I edit my site, does that, my site script, if by editing the just editing the site script, I don't change any of the sites where the site script has been applied, where the site template has been applied. Um, but let's say I edit the site script and I add another column or a few more columns. Now, when I run that site template again on the SharePoint site, it will simply create those new columns on that same list. It's going to go, it's going to see, hey, this list already exists. So what's missing from it? These four new columns, I'm going to go ahead and create it. So it doesn't delete anything. A site template does not delete anything when you apply it. If it, if you have a theme on a site and you're applying a new theme, then it adds, it creates the new theme and removes the old theme, but it doesn't delete anything. So they could be run again on the same site after provisioning, as we just mentioned. Now, what can you do? What are the actions available within the site script? So you could create new lists or libraries, or you can modify the uh, default one that's created with the site. So you could add columns to the default document library. You can create site columns, content types, and configure other list settings. You could set branding properties like the navigation, layout, header layout, header background, uh, apply a theme. You could set the site logo. You could add links to the quick launch or a hub navigation at the top or the sides. You could trigger a power automate flow. This, you know, opens up tons of uh, possibilities and uh, you know as I mentioned before you could trigger an Azure function that applies PMP provisioning template to the site um, or you can make Microsoft graph calls or send out a Teams notification there's uh, you know the pop possibilities are, are infinite um, so you could use your imagination for that the only gotcha of the triggering the power automate flow is that that uses a premium connector. It uses the um, uh, respond, or excuse me, like the. Uh, it uses an action of when a HTTP request is received, so that requires a, a premium license. So keep that in mind. You could install a deployed solution from the app catalog. Set regional settings for the site. Join that site to a hub site. You could install add-ins or solutions, register extensions. Um, you could add principles, so users and groups to SharePoint roles. Um, the asterisk means that it's blocked for sites that are for private channels. And you could set external share, uh, sharing capability for the site. Now, how are some ways you could do this? So, I remember when I first started, JSON used to be very intimidating to me, and uh, I would constantly lose where the comma is supposed to go to separate one in one JSON object to the other. Um, so there's certain tools that are available for free that you could access that help in building out some of these scripts and uh, manipulating the JSON. So one way is that you could run a commandlet, a PowerShell commandlet to extract the JSON 
no JSON object notation um, specific to a list. Or so you could get the configuration of that list in JSON form. You could get it for you could run the get SPO site script from the web to get it for an entire site. And then modify it accordingly. Um, and then you could use two. You know, free source, free resources. Site Design Studio is one of them. Site Design Studio is a um, uh, a web part that you would install onto your SharePoint site, and then it allows you to build out site scripts accordingly. Um, same thing with the Site Designer. What could you do? So, primarily, so when dealing with SharePoint site scripts, you are using PowerShell or the REST API to create your scripts and to group those scripts together and apply them and create a site template. That site template, again, is what you're going to then apply to a SharePoint site. So the smallest building blocks here that we have are the PowerShell actions, the commandlets, or the REST API calls. So we could add SharePoint site design. As you could see, the commandlets still have the old name of site design. So you could just, you know, you're still using these commandlets, but if you anytime you see site design, it's referring to site script, or excuse me, site template. See, I'm gonna confuse myself there. And uh, you know, site script is still the same site scripts. So you could add sites templates, site designs, add site scripts. Um, you could get the get the ones that exist already. You could get any of the ones that are currently running. You could, you know, get all of the site scripts applied to a website, to a SharePoint site, get the ones applied to a list. You could grant SPO site design rights. So that is um, scoping, which we'll talk about. You could invoke, so you could apply the site design, the site template from directly from PowerShell. We're going to go in and show you how you could show you in the UI how to do that. Um, and then you could revoke, you could remove the scripts. So essentially delete the scripts or site templates that you've created and um, and setting them. So in the PMP GitHub there uh, repository, there is several site script samples that you could go in and take a look at or adopt, or, you know, again, a site template consists of multiple site scripts. So you could get these site scripts and individually add them to pick and play and, and pick and choose and add them to a site template. Um, and then apply that site template to a um, to a site to a SharePoint site. So we could see here we have, you know, joining the hub site, uh, triggering an Azure function, creating the or configuring the dynamic links to Office 365 groups, creating a formatted SharePoint list, um, creating SharePoint lists that look up to each other, um, registering SharePoint. Uh, SPFX extension, and uh, uh, this one's a cool one. The trigger flow right back site properties to SharePoint list. You could apply the site template. This triggers a flow that you know that that the site template creates a list that on that site that could store the properties that you're creating that you're customizing. It could trigger a flow to then write back to that SharePoint list. The everything that you applied. So that way you can create your own version of logging um, or tracking some of the customizations that you've made to that site. All right, time for a demo. So in this demo, we're going to create the site script using PowerShell. We're going to add that site script to the site template that we're creating, and then we're going to apply it to a site. So I have my scripts here and 
and we're going to have PowerShell. <clears throat> so first of all, Alex, if I, you can make that just a little bit larger, that'll probably help us. Is that better? Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I have already connected to SharePoint Online service using the um, Connect SPO service commandlet. So if you're going to follow along and you're in PowerShell, be sure to connect to your um, SPO service. So next thing I'm going to do is that I have a site script, right? This site script is, so for example, uh, in my organization, my previous organization in my healthcare role, we worked with, um, in our therapists would go out to children's homes and provide ABA um, behavioral therapy to some of these kids. And some of these kids had different deficits. So some had language deficits, others had um, instances of problem behavior. So hitting, spitting, you know, you name it, we've seen it. So we are, what we do is that, or what we used to do is we take data on these behaviors as they happen and then <clears throat> create interventions to apply before and after the behavior occurs in order to reduce the probability of that behavior occurring in the future. Um, so in order for that to work and to make sure that we're accurately capturing the um, what the behavior looked like and the scenario surrounding the behavior, we collect what's called ABC data. So that's one list that we're going to create. We're going to create an ABC data collection SharePoint list because what we're going to do is that we're going to create a SharePoint site that is specific or a group that is specific to this one client. So that means our team can go in, the clinical team can go in to that site and they should be able to, you know, store client documents from and within the shared documents full uh, document library, but they could also collect data the ABC data using the ABC data SharePoint list. And another thing that happens, unfortunately, we had the clinical role of collecting ABC data. Then I was also um, as a co-owner in the administrative role of managing a business. So one of the things that factored into uh, managing these clients is that since we're in the homes and people live busy lives, there are client cancellations can happen frequently. So there is most as most clinical companies have, there's cancellation policies. So we need to be able to track when a cancellation happens. So I'm going to create a SharePoint list also, <clears throat> excuse me, that creates, that tracks uh, client cancellations. So one of the clinical team members can go in and anytime a cancellation happens, they could go in and track it on the SharePoint list. So I've, got navigated to the Microsoft documentation on site templates, and there is a JSON schema reference, and that is where you could get the sample of that you can modify of how to create this uh, SharePoint list using the JSON schema. So I have in my client cancellations list, we are using a regular SharePoint list with uh, Client name is a text field. Date time, it is a uh, date time column field type calling uh, named apartment start time, appointment start time. So when did the appointment that got canceled occur, uh, start? Who's the therapist that was scheduled to work with that client? And any notes, maybe cancellation reason. All right, and then the other list that we're going to create is the ABC data collection. What is ABC data? It is antecedent, what happened directly before the behavior. B, behavior, what happened. Consequence, what happened immediately after the behavior. So we have the SharePoint list, antecedent, or SharePoint columns. Antecedent, behavior, consequence, who is the therapist that witnessed it, what time did it occur, and the client name. So we are going to now create this 
site script in SharePoint in uh, PowerShell. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to. After I have the SharePoint, there, excuse me, the um, site script. Set up, I'm going to put it inside of a variable called site script. Paste it in. So I'm going to put the site script inside this variable. Press enter. And now I know it's in that variable. How do I know? Because I could. Type in site script. And it, it comes out again, right now. I want to create our site script. So for that, I'm going to use the add SPO site script. Commandlet. Now it's going to add a SPO site script with the con with the content being that variable that we just created. This is going to be I'm going to call this. Script client data list because I'm collecting different types of client data. And the description. This is a description for creating a list that tracks client data. All right. Now I'm going to press enter. And now we've created the SharePoint site script and we have a ID referencing that script. So now we want to get that script because we can't just apply a script to a site. We need to have it as a site temp, put it in a site template. So now I'm going to create a site template. Using the commandlet add SPO site design. The site template or add SPO site design commandlet accepts an array of site scripts, site script IDs. So in this case, we're not using multiple site scripts. We're just going to apply this same the, the site script that we just created. We're going to add that to this new site the site template. Our site template is called clinical client site. So when someone navigates to the UI and they see they go to uh, organization templates, they're going to see a template called clinical client site. And this is web web template 64. So this is going to apply for team sites. Right, if you put in 68, then it'll apply for communication sites. And then our description, this is a site for storing clinical client specific documents. All right, I've added the ID, pass that in. I'm going to go ahead and create the. Site template. So now we've created the site template and we have our site ID or excuse me, our ID for that site template. All right, now. Now that I've created that site template. I'm going to go and. Create a here, where are we? There we go. I'm going to create a, a team site. And I'm going to use naming conventions. So, you know, ideally your organization has naming conventions for creating groups or team sites. Um, if not, there's good, great blogs and, um, you know, ideas that you could go ahead and, and use to standardize that. There's tools that help you with that at Obsidian. We have an internal tool called WorkSpot that helps. Um, with having uniform standardized naming structure for groups or sites that are created. So in the case of my old organization, we used to have group client and then the client's initials because we don't want to have identity identifying um, protected health information. So I'm going to create one for um, John Doe. So and this is the second John Doe that exists in our organization. So I'm going to create a site name called Group Client John Doe. Well, two. This is um, you know protected by HIPAA information. So I'm going to apply a sensitivity label of internal use only, which is going to restrict external access to this site um, <clears throat> accordingly. So now I'm going to create my site. 
go ahead and add another one. All right, now I've created my site. Let's see. So it looks like when you create a site in that way, you don't get the prompt of applying the site template. I think you get it maybe if you're if you create it in the admin center. But either way, this is just your out of the box team site <clears throat> that's created. But now if I navigate to the settings icon and apply a site template, I could see in the from your organization section, now I see my clinical client site that we just created. We see the site template that we just created. So now I could apply it. And this tells you exactly what it's going to do. It's going to create the list for client cancellations, create the columns within that list, create the list for ABC data and the columns within that list. So we're going to go ahead and apply it. Depending on how long your site template, how many scripts are contained in it, and how complex it is, it could take longer, but you could always see the progress while it's running at the top here. And when it's done, it'll this little um, notification will turn green and prompt you to refresh and you'll see the changes are applied. So we'll give it a second here. Kind of while we're waiting for that, um, you know, just I'll just add, you know, you know, this this concept, you know, we thought, you know, going with the kind of Microsoft list side of things um, is related in the fact that we see a lot of people have needs for like a common type of list added to, you know, kind of a, a, a same category of site, you know, be it pro a project site, a, a clinical client site, something like that. It's a lot of value you can get out of um, templatizing and, and kind of applying that um, when you're creating multiples of something uh, over and over again. So, yeah, that was an awesome overview. I'm hoping this isn't a demo fail because I <laughs> don't think it's taken this long to apply it um, in the past here. I'm hesitant to refresh here because I don't want to log jam it. But while that's waiting, I could go ahead and show you another site here. So this site, if I want to go and apply a site template. So right now this is a uh, communication site, so I only see the communication site templates by default. The one that's applied is topics. This is the one that everyone's used to, but you can now use one of these. So if I want to go and apply the learning central one, I could go and apply that template. And this is going to apply the theme. It's going to modify the page. Add the branding and so forth. So as you can see here now, since we're since this only. This doesn't delete anything. I could go and let's say I want to change this. I want to add. I want to change this from Learning Central to Crisis Management. So I could go apply this template. So this one might have a few more things, a few more actions from within those scripts that make it take a little longer. But now we see here that it has been updated. So now let's go back to here. We could see our site template has been applied. So now if I navigate to site contents, I have my ABC data and my client cancellations sections, uh, SharePoint lists. And so lastly, to summarize here, let me. So these SharePoint site templates can be scoped to specific users or groups so that only they see it. Uh, by default, everyone that could create a SharePoint site can see the site templates that are created until you scope them using the grant SPO site design rights commandlet. 
Um, again, the site templates are specific to the specific site type. So modern team, modern site templates. So 64 for team site, 68 for communication site. Some limitations only supported by SharePoint Online. Uh, we mentioned the commandlets only having are still having the old site design name. Um, you have to have create SharePoint site permission to apply these. <clears throat> the Power Automate flow trigger requiring additional licensing and the limitations on actions within site scripts or site scripts and site templates per tenant. And in order to do this, you could use REST API or uh, PowerShell within PMP or the, or the uh, CLI. And lastly, some resources. So the JSON, as I mentioned before, it could get daunting. So you could use websites like sitedesigner.io, um, sptools.netlify app, and um, <clears throat> the Site Design Studio to help you create some of these JSON object uh, notations. So here's an example of SB Tools Netlify app. I want to go and create a SharePoint list. It will prompt me to use any of the um, sub actions or actions and fill in, and then I could just download or copy. Now the other tools do uh, similar things. Just you know, as Site Design Studios, you have to import as a web part. All right, and that is my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, not sure how much time we have for questions, but uh, thank you for uh, attending. Yeah, yeah. No, we have a, a couple minutes. Um, so. But yeah, thank you again for for showing that. Again, this is like an endless uh, amount of detail that you can really get into with these templates and designs. You know, it's it's going to continue to get easier to use, I think, from the Microsoft perspective. So like even those site templates, um, they've been around a while, but they've only recently really coming into um, the tool itself. Uh, so, you know, it, it's good to see Microsoft kind of continue to move that way. You know, for those that have used the lookbook that's out there, you know, that's kind of remote provisioning using similar um, kind of concepts and things like that, that Microsoft's moving into the product. So I, I see them continuing to move a lot into the product, but at the same time, um, you know, it's it's not in there, so you can do whatever you want, right? So yeah, it's very extensible um, and, and really can, put, you know, real good governance, like Nate's saying, and, you know, consistency automation into your environment, um, especially when you get to bigger environments and reusable components, that's great to use. All right, um, so open floor, um, only probably a minute or two. Any, any final questions though, um, for anyone that we wanna throw out there for today? All right, well, thank you all for joining. Um, we should be back on track for kind of a November meeting. Um, and most likely that's probably an Ignite recap um, based on Ignite being early uh, November. So uh, it's probably where we'll end up there. But as always, let me or Anthony or any of us in the speakers or anyone know if you've got topics or ideas for upcoming uh, meetings and discussions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone. That was awesome. Thank you very much.